thank you, thank you, thank you, and welcome all. And I just want to say on behalf of DIAC, thank you all for joining us today. And we have a fantastic guest speaker from the National Center of Civil and Human Rights. And we're going to have a Q&A facilitated by our own Joe Kennedy and Tomanika Burt. So we're so excited about that. And actually, before we get started, I want to give a big shout out and a thank you to Joe. I know Joe has been trying to put this together since over a year. So thank you so much for Joe um, for putting this together. You're going to have a fantastic time. Um, and again, at this point, I'm just going to turn it over to you, Joe. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Thank you, Courtney. Um, very excited today for our speaker. Uh, Courtney mentioned that we have really uh, been trying to get this for a year um, since last um, Juneteenth, really, and timing just didn't work out. So we were really excited when our speaker today um, committed to this for us. Um, today, we're going to be talking about Juneteenth, um, celebrating the spirit of finding and making freedom. Um, our speaker leads all the educational initiatives at the Center for Civil and Human Rights. Um, she's a historian with more than 10 years of museum experience. Her primary focus has been around the interpretation of enslavement at historic sites and museums. Um, and currently she serves on the board of directors for the Slave Dwelling Project and is an active member of the National Council on Public History and the American Association for State and Local History. She is a proud Charlotte 49er. She got both of her undergraduate and her graduate degrees from the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. And we're really excited to present to you today, um, Nicole A. Moore. So thank you, Nicole. Um, and uh, again, this is awesome that you can do this for us. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Tamanika. And thank you all for having me. I am super excited to do this. Um, Juneteenth is, of course, the latest federal holiday. And so there's been a lot of inquiry about the holiday itself. What does it mean? Where has it originated? And I'm gonna get into that, I promise you. But first I wanted to um, make sure that y'all know kind of where I'm from and, and what we do at the National Center for Civil and Human Rights, which is always proud to work with Joe and the team. So the center is located in Atlanta, Georgia. We are actually located right next to the Georgia Aquarium. So, hey, neighbors. Um, and we were, we opened in 2014. The center was the vision of civil rights activist, the late Evelyn Lowry um, and Ambassador still with us, Ambassador Andrew Young, they wanted a place where we could talk about civil rights movement in Atlanta. Atlanta has been called a lot of things with the movement, the cradle, the beginning, but really I like to call it the brain trust of the movement. It's where a lot of the organizations like the Southern Christian Leadership Conference um, and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, where they were headquartered. Um, it is the home to the largest consortium of historically black colleges and universities, which gave us iconic leaders like um, Julian Bond and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And it is the birthplace of Dr. King. And so they wanted a place where we could talk about this legacy and where we could talk about this history. What better place than Atlanta? But you can't, you can't quite talk about Atlanta and the civil rights movement without the acknowledgement that Atlanta today is a global city. Um, there's it's home to many Fortune 500s. And they realized in this process of creating a museum that looked at the American civil rights movement, you got to talk about the global human rights movement. And so that's why we have the National Center for Civil and Human Rights. We are, like I said, we opened in 2014. So we are about to hit our eighth year in operation. Our mission is that we want to inspire visitors with um, visitors and our audiences, both virtually and from afar, um, with immersive exhibits, these dynamic events and conversations, engagement and educational training and programming um, that really help engage people to take the protection of every human's rights personally. We do this through numerous initiatives like our repair course that we are doing with law enforcement and also our DE&I um, sessions that we hold, but our Truth and Transformation, which is one of our newest initiatives, it's gonna help to broaden, help Atlantans particularly to broaden their community engagement um, and how we honestly talk about American history. And so it's gonna look particularly about racial violence through memorialization, commemoration, 
public education, curricular materials, and civic engagement, specifically around the 1906 race massacre that happened in Atlanta, and also looking at convict leasing from the Bellwood Quarry, which is on the west side, and the Chattahoochee Brick Company, and really doing a lot of reconciliation with the community about the history and being honest about it. I am so excited to be a part of the center team. I have been there for seven years and doing all of this work, particularly in education, not just through K-12, but y'all are clearly not K-12 and I am here educating you today, um, working with all of our groups that want to know more about the history. This is what we do. This is why we are here because it is important at all ages that we understand the value of civil and human rights, but also fill in some of the gaps that we didn't learn when we were in school. I look a lot younger, I can tell on this Zoom than I actually am. Um, and there is some stuff that I am finding out even through eight years of college and a whole K through 12 experience. And so it has been really eye-opening and enlightening. And for those of you that are not in the area who are not able to come and see us in Atlanta here on Pepperton Place, never fret, I got y'all. Um, because the center does offer a virtual tour, and I'm dropping that link in the chat for you all to check out. We welcome you to come and see us if you can in person. And if you can't, check us out online and make sure that you are engaging with our virtual programming through our Campaign for Equal Dignity. And also just staying in the loop with what we're doing. We're going to expand our building. We are going to add on two new wings so that we can really dive into this history and take a look back, starting with Reconstruction and moving forward through the movement past the assassination of Dr. King, because that's currently where we kind of stop that exhibit is 54 to 68. But we want to give people a broader view of why the American Civil Rights Movement that we know of existed. And it started long before 54. And it's still going today. So the assassination of Dr. King did not stop that movement. Rather, it, it evolved it a bit. And we wanted, we're excited to tell that story with our audiences. We're going to be looking at racial terror and lynching and the impact that it has on our country. And also, how do we understand and memorialize that properly and give space to the victims? And then we are really going to... Um, we're, we're going to turn things up. We're going to reimagine our King Gallery. We are home to the Morehouse College Martin Luther King Jr. Collection, which is um, a rotating exhibit of the 13,000 plus documents in a farmer that belong to Dr. King. And we're going to reimagine that space. And it's, I've been in the expansion meetings. I've seen the sketches. You're not ready. You're not ready. It is going to be amazing and more interactive and really helping people understand not just not understand Dr. King not just as a leader, but as a man and as a human being, and realizing that I like to tell people he was everyday people who did extraordinary things. And when you get to know him through his work, through his writings and those drafts, then you realize you have a great connection with him. And so I am excited for visitors to really um, get into that. So that is forthcoming at the center. It's a little bit about us. And like I said, if y'all are in Atlanta, come see us. No excuse not to. But if you can't make it to Atlanta, by all means, check out our virtual tour. It is phenomenal and it gives you just a taste um, so that, you know, you, next thing you know, you're on the next plane to Atlanta coming to see us anyway. So, but I am here for y'all's program on Juneteenth. And I'm excited um, because as a public historian whose work is around um, enslavement and talking about um, slavery at historic sites, this is exciting to me. Like Juneteenth is it. <clears throat> I, love, I love a good food associated holiday. I love something that calls a celebration because people come together around food and, and a great way to talk about our history is for me at least by incorporating food and tradition. And Juneteenth is that celebration where we ignite, where we commemorate when those men, women, and children who are enslaved in Galveston, Texas, learned that they were free two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation. Two and a half years. Just kidding. I know news travels slowly, but come on now. And so before we get to emancipation, let's say that's the end of our timeline. I'm going to take you back a little bit. Because one of the things that we have to acknowledge and remember is that um, those that were enslaved, they weren't just waiting for freedom. They weren't waiting for somebody to give it to them. There was a lot of self-emancipation happening. And so we see that as forms of resistance. And for those that 
we're not on the self-emancipation bandwagon, not a problem. Change did come. You have the Civil War kind of popping off, right? Things are going and Lincoln is like, mm, there needs to be a little bit of a shift in the energy. We, we, we need to do something. And so in September of 1960, not 19, Lord have mercy, 1862, he drafts um, the Emancipation Proclamation. And so this is put out September 22nd of 1862, and it has a hundred day period on it. So that's the one thing that people don't realize. Like, it's, first of all, he was like, y'all got a hundred days to get it together. In a hundred days, it's about to go down. And so when people think about the Emancipation Proclamation, one of the things that they do, one of its kind of misconceptions is that it freed everybody and that it was just this automatic automatic um, document. So I've dropped the document in the chat because for those of you that are nosy like me, you'll wanna read it really in full if you haven't. The Emancipation Proclamation itself is one of my favorite historically flawed documents. And I say that because again, it didn't free everybody. It freed those that were in states that were being held in states of rebellion. And then even that, it was certain counties in some states where those that were enslaved were not freed by this document. And I'm talking about spots in Virginia, spots in Delaware, like reading it, I used to live in Virginia Beach and Princess Anne County was the county that Virginia Beach is housed in. Those that were enslaved in Princess Anne County, those that were enslaved in Norfolk and Portsmouth, they weren't freed. They were, they might've been counties that weren't under union control, but those individuals did not gain their freedom then. And so you'll have a lot of people thinking, well, this document freed everybody. So when we talk about Juneteenth, I don't understand because they've had this freedom before. I'm gonna get there. We look at this document and we understand that emancipation, though, while it provided freedom, which is the greatest thing that it could provide, that's all it did. It didn't provide food, clothing, or shelter, jobs, nothing. It just said, hey, y'all, you can leave. You can move about the cabin. That's it. And when I get people to understand that and why Juneteenth is so significant and why it's such a celebration, it's because there were steps to freedom even when it was legal, even when there was this proclamation, there were still steps to actually attaining and, and having freedom. And so we get through the war, Civil War ends April 19, 1865. Why do I keep trying to put this in the 1900s? I do not know, but it ends in 1865. And you're thinking, okay, cool, cool, cool. The war is over now. People should be free. This is great, we're moving along. Y'all know, no internet, postal service, mad slow. It takes, and not only that, there were people throughout the states that knew that freedom was there. They knew about the Emancipation Proclamation two years ago. They knew that this information was out there. They knew what they needed to do as now former slave owners. There was nobody there to enforce it. And so, what we see with Juneteenth, June 19th, and this order that comes through, um, General Order Number 3, you're seeing for the first time in Galveston, and this is at the, the farthest edges of the, um, let me copy this, the farthest edges of basically the Confederacy at this point, or the former Confederacy, you are seeing general, um, not general, you're seeing federal occupation. And so when this order comes out, this order states that, hey, y'all in Texas, press it, guess what? You've been freed. Not only are you free, but you've pretty much been free for the past two years. But what we're gonna need you to do is we need you to kind of stay where you're at. They were advised, those men, women, and children who are now free, they were advised to remain at their present homes and to work for wages. They were told not to show up at military posts, but basically just y'all can y'all can move around. Best thing is to kind of stay at home and and, find, and get paid for your labor now. It's no longer free. You deserve wages. I mean, and that's cause for celebration because you're thinking about a system that was, was backbreaking, soul crushing, and it built the economy. And these men and women and children were forced to do this for free. And now they're told, you don't have to do it for free anymore. You need, they need to pay you. 
And in this moment on June 19th, when this information is being digested, there is this outpouring of just relief, of gratitude, of celebration of Thanksgiving because they were free. You could finally reunite with loved ones if you knew where they were. You could start the search to find your family. You could reconnect and you can build a life. And it's so important that when they hear this news, that it really kind of sits for a minute. It's like, y'all, we are really, really free. This has happened for us. This is it, like, this is great. And we think about that. And as a historian, one still boggles my mind that two and a half years later, folks who knew the law, who knew this proclamation was here, because it wasn't necessarily a law yet. They knew this information and they withheld it. And clearly selfish reasons, you know, you know, if you have a labor force and you suddenly tell them you're free, you don't have to be here anymore. More than likely, folks are gonna be like, all right, I'm out. I'm done here. This is, this is not the life that I wanna live. This is not the life that I want for my children. And this is not the life that my ancestors wanted for me. And so to hold that information and to find out that you're finally free, it's, it's a wave of emotions. But freedom wasn't constitutionally guaranteed until that December with the ratification of the 13th Amendment. And this is the amendment that outlaws slavery, particularly chattel slavery in the United States. And a lot of people, they'll think about afterwards and reconstruction and slavery by another name. This is what says, you cannot hold people in bondage anymore constitutionally except for in terms of prison and servitude and servitude in, within prison, so in incarceration. That's a whole nother can of worms. We're not gonna go there today. <laughs> but when you, when you think about that, the processes that it took from self-emancipation to first, I will, I will credit some of the Northern colonies that got on the outlaw bandwagon earlier in the 19th century, but there were still people that did hold slaves in the North. And as that filtered down, then you have manumissions, which is when you are freeing people on kind of a case by case basis. You have self emancipation that is happening for those who decided I'm not gonna wait for the ink to dry for somebody to write out a piece of paper that I'm free. I'm free because I said I'm free. Then you have this proclamation. And then you have the joy of Granger coming into Galveston and saying, guess what y'all got some news. But this 13th Amendment, that's the thing that solidifies freedom for everyone. Because remember I said the Emancipation Proclamation didn't free everybody. When this 13th Amendment is signed and it is ratified, that is when slavery in this country formally and should have officially ended. And so this, when we celebrate Juneteenth, the first Juneteenth celebration is the next year um, in 1866, because this is a true moment of freedom and celebration. 1865, don't get it, don't get it twisted. They were, they were jubilant in that moment. And there were, there were services of prayer and gratitude and fellowship. But in 1866, this is when the first Juneteenth celebration happens in Galveston. And this is a big to do. This is when we are looking at these massive programs that have prayer meetings and songs and they're singing spirituals. And they are, they're having moments of gratitude. This is when you have families coming together and the community coming together and gathering and really saying to each other, y'all, we made it. We made it. It's been a year, but it's been an official six months and we out here. Like we have our freedom. We have the opportunity to live our lives on our terms. We have the opportunity to build a legacy for our families. We're gonna celebrate. Not only are we going to celebrate, we're going to have a good time while we celebrate with songs and dances. And remember I said food? We're having food. <laughs> we are throwing down. Y'all know Texas is known for barbecue. And so that is exactly what's happening. They are doing barbecue. They are drinking strawberry soda. And people have asked me, they're like, historically, ma'am, really strawberry soda? Yes. They are having strawberry soda. They are having red beverages, which represent some of the colors um, from various countries in Africa. 
red is a symbol of strength. And so you're having red foods, red beverages. So foods like watermelon. Later on, red velvet cake. You're having um, these beverages like the strawberry soda or a berry flavored beverage or sorrel tea, which is a hibiscus tea and that's really red. They're having all of the foods, all of the foods. And they are coming together and they are bringing that and they are having these communal tables. And it's in these moments where they're really, because again, what did I say? People get down with some food and that is a time where you can sit, talk and fellowship. They're having those moments. And this is a tradition that continues to this day. Started in Texas, Buffalo was another city that picked up on the Juneteenth festivities. I think they started holding their formal Juneteenth events in the 1970s, and they are one of the longest standing Juneteenth celebrations outside of Texas. It's finally now a federal holiday. It is something that we as a community have been celebrating in pockets here, there, and everywhere. But now it is something that has gained one national attention and it's getting its due. And it's so important that when you look at this holiday and you're thinking, I mean, what's the big deal? It is a commemoration and it is a moment of gratitude. And it is a moment to sit and reflect on, for those who are descended of the enslaved, of the challenges, the heartbreak, the, the tragedies of our ancestors, but also their triumphs. Because I always like to tell people, there's no shame in being descended from those who are enslaved because you are a testament to their survival because they had to survive for you to be here. And so this is also a time to acknowledge that their life is a whole sacrifice for you to be here. Their freedom, not theirs, but them hoping one day somebody related to them would know what it would wait, would know what it feels to wake up and be free. And it's a time of reflection and reaching out to family. The family that you have by blood, and that some of us don't like our blood family, but also the family that you have chosen. And being thankful that we can have those moments together. And for some of us, it is a day of rest and reflection, but also it's a day to get down and have a good time and to get into all of the barbecue and all of, make sure that whoever makes a potato salad though, that they know how to make potato salad because mm -hmm. nobody wants a Juneteenth celebration with bad potato salad. Y'all know what I mean. Mm -hmm. But it's one of those things where you want to reconnect and you want to celebrate freedom, and, but you also want to know the history. And I think this is a great time for us to, go back into some of those narratives and to just understand where we've come from, where we've been, look at the work that we have to do, but the potential and where we're going. So Juneteenth is officially Sunday, which is also Father's Day. But guess what? For those of you that do get it, it the federal holiday is observed on Monday. So if you do have Monday, you can keep the party going all weekend long. Um, and it's just a time to really just marvel at where we've come and hope that the next generations understand a little bit more about the history that we're just now knowing about. So, thank you. Yeah. Who said no relish? Because uh, <laughs> a good dill relish and a potato salad, you, <laughs> you got it. You have to. It has to be done right. I can tell you haven't had it done right. That's all. Mm. Well, not sweet. No, 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 not sweet. Dill. You need that. It's got to hit you right here, right here. Mm. <laughs> Thank you, Nicole. That was amazing. Y'all are welcome. Um, and for my staff, I know we are officially observing Juneteenth on Monday, but I expect everyone to be back in the office <laughs> ready to work on Tuesday. Um, Dominique and I do have uh, some questions for you. And then uh, Courtney, if there's any uh, questions in the chat, if you want to jump in on those, um, that would be great as well. Um, Dominique, why don't you start the uh, round table? Hi, Nicole. How are you? I'm doing good. Good. Thank you for taking the time out with us today. Um, as a parent, I wanted to know, in your mm -hmm. opinion, how would you say that I... Um, 
talk with my kids about Juneteenth? What's the most important message to get to them? That is a really good question. And as a parent myself, I would say just telling them, you know, I would take it to the Emancipation Proclamation and really just kind of reading it together. Um, just because there's a lot, there's a lot of confusion that people are like, well, the EP freed everybody. So why is this a big deal? But really just reading that and then talking about how it took time for this word to spread. And that just because something is written down and, and given as a proclamation doesn't mean everybody is following it. And so it's important to understand that there was resistance to freedom. And taking that document in Granger's order and just reading through it, maybe even busting out a map. Look, I'm a good map person. Just break it down and say, here, here, and here. This is where it applied. But it took time. And after the war, they had to travel by horse, by, by train to get there. And then they had to come to the town and say, hey, hey. They're knocking on doors. They are ringing bells. And they're just like, y'all are free. And I think just walking through it with your children and, and having those documents there to guide and to, um, to really help. I'm a, I'm a big proponent of primary documents telling the stories. And so having that there and then just kind of reflecting on it, like, you know, how, how do we get information today? How fast can we get information today? What didn't they have then that we have today? And kind of helping, because I know at some ages, like time is a mis time doesn't exist. But there are others as they start to realize this is years and decades and then centuries. Okay, let's go back and let's look at this century and, and what technology they had available. Kind of breaking it down like that, because then I think they'll see, wow, it took a really long time. Oh, no wonder they were so excited. No wonder they were crying and they were just like, never thought the day would come having those conversations, I think, and really just absorbing it together. One of the best ways that you can share this information um, with children and then just having a moment of gratitude and saying, you know, what are you thankful for? Are you, and, and walking them through that because this is also a moment where you have these newly freed people just thankful, thankful that they made it, thankful that they were able to live to see that day, so. That's what, that's what I would do. That's great advice just for talking to your family too, not just the kids. Mm -hmm. It's a mm -hmm. different perspective um, and thinking about it when you're talking, you know, we, they didn't have TVs, they didn't have telephones, everything that we rely on just for, you know, because there, there was nothing. So it literally was word of mouth moving from the farthest reaches of, of one side of the country to another. So it is actually yep. amazing um, yep. that it's even happened within two and a half years. If you really think about all the obstacles that were trying to stop it from happening, um, it's, it's insane actually. Yeah. Um, well, okay, that was deep. <laughs> um, so, you know, I know we're neighbors and uh, mm -hmm. I've been lucky to be part of some of the planning on the expansion of the center as we do the catering and it's exciting mm -hmm. for us as well. I was wondering for you as a historian, what are you uh, looking forward to most in the new um, center galleries that they're building? I am looking forward to some of the enhancements that we're going to do in the Civil Rights Gallery. Um, really breaking away from what we call the master narrative, which is at 54 to 68, only focused on King and talking more about the other leaders, other organizations, mm -hmm. other movements that are happening at this time. We are, hopefully it stays in there. I think it will, because it's so important. We're gonna, we're gonna dive into black power. And because we get that a lot, we get asked that a lot. How come you don't talk about black power? And before it was, you know, in our timeline, it, it's like right at the end. But then the more that we've done the research, we're like, no, this is embedded throughout. And so really kind of giving people those perspectives to understand um, what's happening in our country in all of these areas. But then also we are, we are really going to go take the dive and talk about racial terror and lynching. And we'll be exhibiting some pieces from Without Sanctuary. And it is something that since I've been at the center and known that we've owned this collection, I've wanted 
to have conversations about because the one thing that we tend to focus on historically is the terror and we tend to focus on the violence, but we don't talk about the pushback and we don't talk about the anti-lynching movements and we don't talk about how communities worked to resist. And so to be able to tell those stories together because with something as heavy as lynching, you need to talk about how people fought back and how in some areas they were triumphant and others they weren't, but that there was an effort to fight back and to say that this is not acceptable. And so to have those conversations and to tell those stories in a way that is respectful, that it honors the victims and their families, but that it also empowers people to say, we are not hopeless and we are not helpless is for me as an educator and a historian so important. And to, to give people that moment of nothing is impossible and that just because we see things the way that they are is not the way that they have to be. So I am, those two pieces I'm very excited about. Um, it's new territory for us. Yeah. But I think it's important territory for us um, as we start to tell a complete and whole history. This isn't just Black history. This is American history. And I think the more that we tell people that and the more that we, that we say that, the more that it becomes the norm of, no, this, is, this, is, this belongs to all of us. We need to know it. We need to confront it. We need to sit with the feelings that come with it. But we need to come out of this stronger and more determined to say, we can't, we can't we can't keep doing this. So that's what I am. I'm looking forward to the programming around it and just the reception, good, bad, and ugly. Like I'm here for it all, but I want people talking about it and I want them engaging and I want them questioning why, how, how come, and, and, and having those conversations with their friends, with their families, and, and really understanding what we've done to each other but also realizing that we can't we can't keep moving forward towards progress with this so i think it's really important um you know even in modern messaging that you know we have this new style of lynching really of cancel mm -hmm. culture and making taking those messages from there how important it's going to be for at the k through 12 programs how do, yeah. how do you teach this to a, a child and, and really get the message across? Like you said, that the, the successes from there and the, the story behind how, you, how we got there, I think is really, it's going to be fascinating. Because um, how do you talk about terror with kids and how do you make it, it's still, it's modern. It's still really part of our history. It's mm -hmm. there and people mm -hmm. have to understand that. Um, and I, that, now that you said it, I think it's going to be really fascinating. So that yeah, is it's, actually exciting. It's going to be, it is going to right, be take it away, Tom. Interesting. <laughs> All right. So, um, why do you think every American um, should celebrate Juneteenth? I think because it's it's all of our history, right? This is it's important to, and even if it's not like celebrating, like oh my good times, but commemorating and acknowledging and and reflecting. I think it's important for us to understand because being 100% honest, like the legacy of slavery is still existing. And when people ask, well, how come or why, or I don't understand, like it's that timeline that goes back. And so it's important for us to realize that I need, I need everybody to know that um, September 22nd, 1862, eh. January 1st, 1863, eh, that ratification in December of 65, but those men and women in 65 in June, finding out that they're free, like that's, that's something everybody should know, should be acknowledging and, and just reflecting on it. And it's, it's all of our history, it's all of our story. And it is important that when we talk about American history and when we talk about events that end up being new federal holidays especially if somebody's getting a day off and they're just like yes it's another day off I need you to really sit and understand why um and to you know 
I always tell people crack open a strawberry soda and sit there and just reflect. Um, it's just, it's important that we understand all facets of our history and how we get here, but also that this is a process and to really understand what freedom means is to understand that process. Yeah. Thank um, you. And, yeah, mm -hmm. and talking about every American and then we talk to someone like you, a historian that's living this part of uh, talking this truth every day. What mm -hmm. do you do special to commemorate and to think yourself? I'm gonna let y'all in on a secret, I sleep. <laughs> I take it as a day of rest. <laughs> Um, and it sounds shocking because I'm telling y'all to go out, have fun, do all the things. I'm going to be in bed sleeping. Um, but it's because I carry this work with me um, as a public historian who does living history, who talks about enslavement, who does training on enslavement, enslavement and who works at the center where this is, you know, our continued history. I'm tired. So I'm going to take this moment. I'm going to be thankful for my ancestors. I'm going to be thankful for their willingness to survive. And even though I'm sure there were days where they're like, I'm, I'm out. Um, but the, for me, it's the thought that somebody thought enough about me, even before they knew that I would ever exist, to keep pushing when oppression was everywhere. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rest I'm going to reflect, I'm going to re-energize myself so that I can get up the next day, that Tuesday, because also Monday, <laughs> holiday, um, but I'm going to get up so that I can keep going and so that I can be re-energized to keep pushing forward and keeping these legacies and these stories alive. Oh, I love it. Yeah, I actually have a question from uh, the audience, I should say, with air quotes, but yeah. it's a good one because, yes, so you were talking about, as you've been talking about the truth. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of us um, have heard that um, the red kind of symbolized like the blood of the slaves. And I know you talked about it representing African countries. So they wanted to either um, debunk the myth or is that part of the truth um, as well? As I go to, <laughs> I'm actually looking this up because I do want to make sure that I have it correct. And honestly, I am going to go to a colleague of mine, Michael Twitty's um, definition of what this red meant. He is a food historian and a James Beard winner. And so I am <laughs> in real time, I'm glad I don't have my glasses on because y'all would see me scrolling um, because I do believe it's kind of a mix of both. Um, we have the Pan-African flag, which is the red, green, and black. Um, but that red, a lot of people say that it does kind of stem from the bloodshed, but it's also that red is a color of power. And so when we think about that, when we think about the, the beverages, um, especially the sorrel tea, because it is red, um, it's a, it's a, for those that don't know what sorrel is, it's, it's basically hibiscus. And when you steep it, you get a very rich and red color. Um, but it's kind of, it's all of those things. It doesn't have to necessarily be just one, um, but definitely I have heard other historians talk about just the symbolism of the bloodshed, but also that, that red is a color of power and renewal. And so when you bring all of that together, you get um, the honing in and the focus on red beverages and red foods. Wow. Well, Nicole, that's a wonderful way to end. I tell you this, I mean, to me, you could have kept on, you can keep on talking because this has just been absolutely fantastic. Not even just about Juneteenth, as you said, just giving a, a piece of our, you know, rich history as Americans. Um, so we'll definitely want to have you back. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, and, and part of it is that, you know, just um, as representative Daya, we want to make sure, hope people walked away a little more informed with the truth, as you mentioned before, um, you know, a little more connected to our cultural transformation as we've been doing this um, through Diet, Restaurant Associates, and again, um, hopeful um, that, you know, change is possible. So you talk about all the great things that are coming to the center. So again, thank you all. Have a wonderful afternoon. 